Hello, everybody, and glad you can join us wherever you are around the world at whatever crazy time zone you have to be in. I have a presentation, and I'm going to be doing some live demoing as we go along, and let's see if we can get the screen to share. Uh, good. And let's put this in presentation mode. So I can do this. There we go. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, cool. So we have uh, this interesting problem is we all take lots and lots of photos and we have this wonderful camera in our pocket. And the challenge is to have not create art, but to get photos which draw our viewers in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are good and bad about cell phones themselves. I'm going to discuss one of a number of techniques for getting cell phone photos with impact. And I'll talk about some of the others briefly as we move forward. But framing is this idea of finding the pictures inside your pictures. I'll give you some ideas of things to think about when you're dreaming about improving your pictures, whether or not it's at the time of taking the pictures or afterwards, after you've captured them, things which are ordinary can still be improved. And then I'll do some, I have some examples to show. I'll do some live demo about how I do framing both on the computer and on the cell phone itself. And I'm only using ordinary photos that I've taken on my various cell phones over time. And then if we have some time, I'll talk a little bit about showing, and I'll show you an example of what it, the kind of things that you think about if you frame actually before you take the picture. So, and as we go along, I'm basically going to not only describe what you're seeing, but I'm also going to tell you about my thought processes as a photographer. But first, why am I talking about all of this? Well, I started photographing when I was 11 years old. My dad gave me a camera and he said, make sure there's a family member in every picture because film's expensive. I promptly ignored him. In course four, you can do other things besides architecture. You can be a photography major. I bet you didn't know that. And well, I'm not sure about it now, but it certainly was possible then. I studied with Minor White, who taught me how to look at a photograph and then walk into it. I studied with Doc Edgerton, who taught me how to stop time with his flashes. And Ron McNeil, who was doing the printmaking course, taught me that chemistry was my friend. I was the photographer for the Cambridge Chronicle and the Somerville Journal for a lot of time, so I got to take lots of news photography. I taught a three-tiered course at the Rivers School in Weston, which is a, at that time a private boys' school. I taught at the Codex Center for Creative Imaging, which reached out to pr creative professionals as the digital technologies were first becoming real. I worked for the largest printing company in the world and helped them deal with how do we correct photos and how do we bring pre-press into commercial printing. And then later on, I wrapped up all of this preparation to work for Adobe, where I got to work on parts of Photoshop and helped create Adobe Creative Suite, which, left, which later became Adobe Creative Cloud. So I've been zigzagging my way between th uh, creative and uh, technical things for I guess since I was 11. So that's why I'm here to share some of these insights with you. So let's take a look at this first photograph. Not a bad photograph, Half Moon Bay, not far from where I live in, in the Bay Area. It's got uh, the bay itself. You can see a bird in flight if you look carefully. There's stuff in the background, some rocks in the, in the beginning, and some color to take a look at. It's really, it's not a bad photograph. It's the kind of photograph people take every day. But there's an awful lot to look at in this photograph. And one of the things that about framing is guiding your viewers to look at something that is not just everything in the world, but something that maybe with a guiding focus can get their interest up. So I reframed, this is exactly the same photograph, reframed using a crop tool on, uh, on the computer. And you can see that by getting rid of the hotel in the back and a whole lot of water that I didn't need, I'd, I've created something that's got 
focus on the color, focus on the movement of the, uh, of the bird itself. I don't have to see all of the, the kayaks in order to get the idea what they're all about. And I also have created a bit of motion just in the landscape by the curve that's coming from the, uh, the upper left down to the lower right where the shore meets the water. So here's an example of framing, taking an ordinary-ish kind of photo and giving it a little bit more punch. Uh, now, why doesn't this want to move? Um, let's try it this way. Okay, here's another ordinary photo. Um, in Walking through a playground one day, I saw, look at this interesting stuff that's going on with the shadows and look at those swings. And so I just grabbed a picture of it using the cell phone and it's got a lot going on. It's got all this background and it's got a huge amount of shadow. And I, in fact, when you look at it, you can't even see the swings themselves because there's so much going on. But when I thought maybe I should guide people to look a little closer by getting rid of the distracting background, by reducing the amount of shadow and by making the swings become my focus, the framing says that it's about light and dark, no longer about a swing set. The framing also shows that I can deal with the shadows as separate objects rather than something that is, you, you don't even notice them when you first look at all of this stuff, but by framing, I can create a lot more impact. So what is it about a cell phone camera? Oh, it's got so many things working for it. It's this computational photography that's come out in just the last couple of years that's all about overcoming it being available in your pocket. Small lenses, no shutter speed, uh, dealing with uh, bad or let's say older screens where it's hard for you to see the detail. Everything about what we can do with what we can st stick in our pocket is now about overcoming the fact that it's small enough to put in our pockets and it's fabulous. I would never, even though I could still do it, go back to using a film camera because all of this stuff is great. And it's at our fingertips. It means we can whip our phones out. It's ready to use, it's easy to use, and I don't have to even think about framing photos and creating great artwork. I can just grab stuff and I can apply this approach to making stuff have more impact later. So it removes this, I have to be perfect right at the start. And then it's taking multiple shots in microseconds, dealing with wide ranges of dynamics, high definition, high dynamic range formats. It's taking upwards of, well, I don't know the exact number, but it's easily taking 20 to 30 photographs before I've even pushed the capture button and then analyzing them, helping the exposures be right, getting rid of blur, doing all kinds of wonderful things. So already it's a huge step up to getting to photos with impact. But it also has these, these cons. Like now we have ultra wide lenses. Wow, we didn't have ultra wide lenses before. They're great for taking huge postcard landscapes and for having selfies with a hundred people in them, but they're not good for anything else. Well, it's not that they're not good for anything else, but when you have an ultra wide lens, you can't zoom into something unless it's so close. And if you look at my face, on the screen now. It's so close, it's distorted in the wide angle lens. So that's a problem we have to think about. It also does exposure averaging. And while I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about that as a technique, many photos are overexposed. The camera, manu the cell phone manufacturers with their technology think people like bright, sh exciting photos, and they bring that out by overexposing slightly. Everybody's like, sees photos that pop, and then you lose your connection to the light itself. And then if I want to frame in the camera while I'm taking the pictures, I have to use these zoom just, I have to use these pinch gestures, zooming with my fingers. It's not great for framing. My fingers are like a blunt instrument. So what ends up happening is I get many good 
thing, photos that I call private photos, which I'll explain in a minute. Now I get very few, I get fewer great public photos and I'll explain the difference between these two in a minute. So we need to overcome these cons to so we get to the pros. And of course there's more pros and more cons. I've only just mentioned a few of them. If we wanna have photos with impact. But the good news is we can just use some of these techniques. We don't have to be fancy pants art photographers to do that. So what's the difference between a private photo and a public photo? This is something Minor White used to talk about when I was a photo student in class. The private photo was something like you were there what you saw is, you know, included in like that big photograph of the, of, you know, white, uh, sorry, uh, Half Moon Bay. And it includes a whole lot of other things that aren't easily captured in the photo, like things you smelled, the fish, uh, the temperature was, is the sun out, the sound of the, the seagulls making noise, the wind. All of that other stuff makes these photos exciting to us when we grab these ordinary photos. And what we forget when we're taking these photos is that the people who look at them aren't going to feel the temperature or smell the aromas. Our brain is, is created a visual focus for us that creates, that's fashioned from all of these elements in the pictures. But when the camera takes the picture, it doesn't have a creative brain. It's like when you photograph the moon, unless you've got a super 100, you know, 100 times zoom on a Samsung camera, the moon is gonna look like a pinprick because your brain is taking what you see as the moon and it's telling you the moon is big, so it's gonna translate into something you can see big. You take it with a camera, especially a cell phone camera, especially one which has a ultra wide lens, and it's just going to be the size of a little pinpoint. So we're taking a lot of private photos and we're showing them to people. Some of them are good and some of them need a little bit more help. To provide that help, we need to guide the viewer into what we're interested in. We're going to provide what the camera can't do because it doesn't have a brain. And the whole idea about framing is create a visual focus, guide people into, well, what was important? What's, what's the thing that guided, what that interested me to take the picture in the first place? And the simplest idea is to limit distractions. Public photos can be lurking inside every private photo, whether it looks interesting or not. And framing is a technique that will help us find it, even if we're not art photographers. One last word slide, and then I'll go back to examples. Framing, sometimes people will talk about framing and they'll say it's like, well, it's composition, isn't it? Well, it is, but composition is a whole catch hole of, you know, art, art classes harmony and balance and symmetry and colors and shades and harmony and colors and shapes like circles and triangles and everything else. And how did you use the positive space? How did you use the negative space? What even is that stuff? Framing, if you think about it as not just a part of composition is something that's intentional. All you have to do is think about it as what did you think guided you to the picture? What do you think is worth emphasizing? Maybe you won't even see it in the original photo you took, but you can always go looking for it. Guide the viewer and use the actual frame itself, which defines the space and defines the sense of motion and use that frame as your friend to help guide the viewer. So coming back here, my thought process when I saw this was, wow, I love the light. And I can see that there are these shadows. I haven't the foggiest idea what I really want to do about this, but I just, I'm a, I'm a photographer who just loves light itself. And so I just grabbed the picture and I said to myself, I'm going to fix this later. And the way I fixed it later was to move the frames in the edges, the edges of the picture are my friend. I got rid of a lot of the shadow. I got rid of the whole distracting building. Remember I said a minute ago, the simplest thing you can do is to just get rid of distraction. I left one of the two 
things holding the screen, the, the swings up, because I certainly don't need two of them in the shot. And now I've got the light, I can see the subject. And then I've also got this sense that the shadows themselves might actually be moving because they're at a crazy angle. It's the shadows that are swinging and the swings that I can see are static. How'd the shadows move if the, if the swings are static? That's interesting. Here's another ordinary photo. I tend to look up when I'm walking around. Sometimes I see the tops of buildings. Sometimes I see trees. Here in China, I saw a power grid and I said, well, that's kind of interesting. It looks different from what you see in the United States. And I grabbed the shot of it and I said, I don't know what this is going to be worth, but the shapes kind of interested me. And then I just apply the same technique and say, something distracting here. I don't really care about the clouds. They're pretty, but they're not the point. The tree, it's giving me a sense of height, but maybe that's not so important. The frame is my friend. And I thought, well, what if I bring the frame in? And then I guide the viewer to pay attention to the rhythm of the power thing. What if I put the, the power lines in the corners and then create this sweep. All of a sudden is a movement. Maybe it's the movement of the electricity through the power tower itself. And it's not a great work of art, but it's more engaging and it has more impact simply by removing the distractions. So here's some, here's some ideas for reframing. You can do what I, you can look at like the patterns, like I looked at in the overhead picture. Do they repeat? Are they symmetrical? Are they asymmetrical? If they're symmetrical, can I make them be asymmetric so that I can use the diagonals like I did in this last photo? And diagonals create motion. Symmetry stops it. It's just something in the middle of my picture sorry, went the wrong way. Something in the middle of my picture, you can see this towers in the middle of the picture, basically stops the motion. Here I moved it off the center, use the diagonals, now I have motion. Cropping out distractions, getting rid of blinding lights, sky that you don't need, eye magnets, they just pull your eyes away from the things that are making impact. And as I mentioned before, for this image, I don't need the whole swing set. I don't need the whole shadows. I don't need everything that's in the picture. Just use a part and let the part represent the whole. Contrast is something that you can use, but don't get into, if you're going to use colors, don't make it be like all of the autumn colors at once when you're out photographing the, the fall colors in New England, because everything looks red, everything looks gold. There's no contrast, so it doesn't have impact. And then sometimes just one thing to think about, which I'll come back to in a little bit, is that light, sometimes the light is the real subject. Are the swings really the subject here, or is the light the real subject? I'm not going to answer that. I'm just going to pose it as an interesting way of framing. So here's another ordinary picture. I was on campus. There's the status center. There are clearly better pictures that you could take of the status center. And I don't know exactly what possessed me to take this photograph, but something did. I whipped out my photo, my camera, and I said, well, look, there's this kooky building in the background. And then there's the staircase. And the staircase is kind of leading to the kooky to the kooky building. And I thought to myself, well, isn't that interesting? Maybe to have a kooky education, I need to walk up a kooky staircase. And I think that's what I was thinking when I took the picture. And when I started to play around with this, I realized, well, if I were gonna isolate and, and create, you know, get rid of distraction and create, do something with the status center, maybe this wasn't the best angle for that. But look what's staring me in the face, I have this, crazy staircase. And when it's being distracted by the sky and the status center and the pavement, it's really hard to see how kooky it is. But maybe I just use the frames as my friend. And this crazy staircase all of a sudden has its own shape. It has its own movement. And while it's not the world's greatest art photography, it's a lot more interesting to look at than so many, so many things going on at once. 
So again, here's another example in my thinking that went into, you know, I started out being attracted to something. I think I really was attracted to the staircase, but I didn't even understand how. So instead of making it be perfect in the beginning, just take the picture and realize that I can make it have impact later. It's exactly the same mm -hmm. photograph. Now, here's a slightly different thing that I'm not going to go into great detail for is, and you can frame with light. This is the subject of another webinar that we'll do later. And that these are two separate photographs, but I mentioned that the, I mentioned that the camera overexposes. Well, this is a perfectly fine interior shot that the camera fixed the light for me for, but I didn't want the camera to fix the light by darkening it the light becomes more interesting. It's a part of the environment. I can actually see the shapes better and the photograph has more impact. So I just wanna show you that there's lots of ways to skin this cat. Okay, so now I'm going to shift and show you some live framing. And we'll start with this photograph Paul, I took out. There was a question that came in from Adam Miller yeah. and he asked, uh, do you try to stick to certain size ratios, like 16 to 9 or 4 to 3, etc., or if you think it's okay to go free form? Go free form. Let the camera capture as much as possible unless you make decisions about framing before you take the picture. And then you have the ability to just free form to whatever shape you really need. As long as this isn't going to go in a store-bought Ikea 11 by, you know, eight and a half by 11 frame or eight by 10 frame, you have the freedom to display in your computer environment for impact. So I took this photograph out the front windshield of my car at a red, stop, stop, at a red light. I said to myself, well, there's a neat sunset. All right, so I got a nice sunset. I could show this to people, but there's a lot of distraction in it, which takes away from the impact. So the first thing I try, and this is just using the preview in my Mac, is I'm gonna just crop out a bunch of the sky and then look at that. Oops, I don't own the file. Forget that, I do own the file. Um, why didn't that work? Sorry, this is Zoom doing bad things. Oh, stop. Okay, so here I've created a crop of it. And let me just increase this so you can't see it. And that's better, but it's still distracting. I've got the traffic light. I've got a lot. I've got this whole light pole. I don't really need that to create the impact. So. One more time, I can come back and say, how about I let just the part of this light pole be a part of it? What if I get rid of the, the, what if I get rid of the traffic light? And even that seems like too much for me. What if instead of having all of that tree, what if I get rid of some of the tree, a lot of the traffic light, and then I crop down from the top and focus in on that. Now what I've done is by getting rid of the distractions, I've created a focus, a focus I can work with where the, the sunset itself is interacting with something that has a visual shape, something that I can guide my viewer to that is the power tower. Was the picture about the power tower? No. Is it more about the power tower? Yes. Is it also about how the light plays off the sky and how the wires and how the clouds all interact with each other? Yes. I got to watch the clock here because I want to show you how to do this. Uh, delete copy. So um, I was going to do, I'll do a quick one example of a different kind of framing for this one, which we looked at. I could have the framing be all about the bird. And by cropping the bird, you can, and then I'll make it big. You can see I've created a whole different kind of impact from the very same photograph, simply by changing the framing. Uh, I'll skip this one for time. I did a sunset. Let's skip that one. Now, I think this 
is the one I'm looking for. No, wrong. Uh, I just closed one that I wanted to reopen. So oh, I'll tell you what, I'll do it on the phone instead. So I have to stop sharing for a second. And how are we doing for time? I still have two minutes. And then I have to reshare my phone. Okay. So can you all see my phone? Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to go to my photos app. And here's a photograph that I took in, in China. And this is just a modern day hotel built to look like it's an old hotel or an old, old housing. So there's a lot of photos hidden in this very public photo. The way I'm going to get to that is to hit edit, hit tap the photo, hit edit in the upper right hand corner, hit the framing icon, which is on the right, it's over here, and then tap the free form icon. And now I can do this very same framing on in my camera. I don't have to wait to get it home. So by grabbing the edges. Oh, sorry, I have to do it this way. I can look for, say, is there something about this part of the image? And then the phone shows me, ah, well, that's interesting, but maybe not. Maybe I can crop it in a little bit more and make a public image out of that. All right, that's one thing I could look at itself. Now I'll reset the image. And there's something more interesting. There's the bridge. What if I crop using, just crop down to get to the bridge? That's a little bit more interesting itself. At least I can now zero in on the bridge, but I can use my technique. I don't need to look at the whole bridge. I c the bridge itself is actually kind of a distraction. What if I just use a part of the bridge to represent the whole and then let the reflection show me the whole rest of the photograph and then crop in a little bit more and the camera itself shows me the cropping as I move along. Maybe that's just a touch too much. And it's all live while I'm working with it. So we've got the tools in our hands. The camera lets us do it even while we're working on it. And by using the techniques that, um, that I mentioned and the ideas that I mentioned in the presentation, which I will bring up just briefly, and I'll end in a second, Patricia. Using these techniques, you can just play to your heart's content. It doesn't have to be perfect. And just look for, here's an ordinary photograph in an art gallery. I liked the vase. And I said to myself, hmm, what if I frame this before I take the picture? I move to the one behind that. Let the part represent the whole. And then I thought, well, this is still kind of boring and static. What if I look for some motion? And I move the camera up to the top. I use the diagonal. I let the part represent the whole. And now there's all this swirling around, kind of like a little hurricane. I don't need to see the whole thing. The frames have been my friend. So there's framing, there's light. I've talked about rhythm and movement. Maybe we'll do some more workshops. The, uh, the presentation's got my contact information. I hope this has given you lots of ideas of how you can take any photograph that you've created in your cell phone and make it be something with more impact. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh that was wonderful. I, I learned a lot from this. I, I know I need to step up my uh, smartphone photography game. So <laughs> thank you. So I see one quick comment. Somebody said distracting. 
everything I say distracting does contribute to a sense of place. And I'm not saying that you should crop pictures the way I do. Some things are about focusing in tight. Some things are about the sense of place. I skipped over a photograph that I took in Tokyo at a hotel window because I was going to run out of time and my cropping, live cropping of that would have kept a healthy amount of the city because I do agree that contributing to a sense of place definitely, definitely uh, is an important aspect about creating impact. Thank you.